take your Bible. If you don't have one, there is one in the pew rack in front of you, and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Pastor Paul is uh, preaching at a church in Windsor today that, Lord willing, will be transitioning to become a Harvest Bible Chapel. Uh, so keep him in your prayers as he's away with uh, Sue. He'll be back with us tonight, I believe, for the, yes, for the prayer service this evening. Praise God. John chapter 1. Listen to this statement. Maybe you've heard it before. Christianity is not a religion. Do you know what comes next? It's a relationship. Maybe some of you have heard that statement before. Um, I have lots, and I would put it in the same category as many other Christian isms like love the sin or hate the sin, or let go and let God, or maybe you've heard this one. When God closes in a door, he opens a window. I don't remember the Bible saying anything about God being an interior designer, but... Now, all of these are very cliche statements. We say them often, but do we really know what, that, what they mean? Now, when I talk with people who say this statement, Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship, I understand the heart of what they're saying. I understand that what they're trying to say is that following Jesus and knowing Jesus isn't some loveless, ritualistic, duty-bound set of rules. I get that. I hope you do too. That's true. Christianity is not like that. But it's kind of unhelpful to try and define the faith by something that we're not. Yes, it's not a relation, but what does it actually mean to actively enjoy a relationship with Jesus? Now, some of you may not know, but that this term, having a relationship with Jesus, I looked, it's not in the Bible. But that doesn't mean it's not appropriate to use it because for those of you who do know God's word, we know that there are many relationships that we share with our Lord Jesus Christ through faith. We know that we need it, but do we really know that what it is? And for, the, for those of us who actually know what it is, are we actively sharing in it and enjoying it? Today, I hope that we're gonna come to share and enjoy a relationship with Jesus on a deeper level. And we're in John chapter one because John reveals the glory of who Jesus Christ is and demonstrates how humanity interacted with our God who made himself known. And as we go through John chapter 1, we are going to see it reveal to us four features of those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus. John 1 verse 1 to 14 is going to reveal to us four features of those who have a relationship with Jesus. I hope you have notes that were provided for you in the bulletin. You can follow along through that, or if you're in a journal or writing on your phone, please uh, please follow along and stand with me now as we uh, read this passage. We stand in honor of God in reading his word. This is God's word. It speaks to us today, and this is what it says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from John, or from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. 
glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray to our God again. Father, thank you that we can know you as you've made yourself known. And Lord, even though at this moment my eyes are closed and I speak out into the air, I know that they are not empty words, but they reach the ear of you, the God who created the heavens and the earth, and the God who came down to this world to make himself fully known. Father, show us through Jesus Christ how we can enjoy a relationship with you. You are good. You are loving. Motivate us. Above all other things we could seek, all of the other things we can enjoy motivate us to seek after and to enjoy you most of all. We give thanks, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Four features of those who have a relationship with Jesus. Now, I found as I studied that I tried to try and define this language. What does it mean to have a relationship? And what I found is that the features that distinguish a relationship with God are actually very similar to the features that distinguish a lot of our our human relationships. And a lot of our human relationships are naturally defined by the terms of the relationship itself. As a teacher naturally teaches, a student naturally needs instruction from that teacher. As a mother naturally loves and provides, so an infant naturally longs for care and nourishment. And in the same way, if we're going to understand the nature of a relationship with God, we need to know his nature. And we need to know how he has chosen to operate. And therein, we can understand how we can interact with him. So the first feature of what it means to have a relationship with Jesus is those who have a relationship with him have gazed upon his glory. If you're taking notes, write that down. Those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus have gazed upon his glory. Yeah, but preacher, like, uh, I, can, I, can, I can gaze upon you right now, and I know you can gaze upon me right now with your eyes, but, but how can I gaze upon something that I can't see with my eyes? Don't worry. Hold on to that. The scriptures will answer that question. But for now, let's see how God is revealed and what we can gaze upon. First, look at verse one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Gaze upon his glory, church. Jesus is the word. Now, this term word was a very familiar concept across cultures and religions in the first century when the gospel according to John was written. Uh, The Babylonian culture had their word, and the Jewish culture had their word, and the Greek culture had their word, and it was a familiar concept across cultures that described a transcendent power. Uh, Maybe this culture's word was what created the universe, or maybe this culture's word is, is what exemplifies what it truly means to be human. But Christianity comes along and says, no, there are not multiple expressions of some transcendent power. There is one word alone. And his name is Jesus. He's not merely some transcendent ethereal power pie in the sky. He is a person that can be known. Gaze upon his glory, he is the word. Gaze upon his glory, he is God. Look at verse one again. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Understand this, church, friends. The full deity of Jesus Christ is a non-negotiable mark of the Christian faith. Before creation, and at creation, and even now, the word, Jesus Christ, was, and is, and always will be, God. Sharing 
divinity with his Father and with the Holy Spirit. Gaze upon his glory. He is the Word. He is God. This also. He is the maker of all things. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3 with me. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So not only does Christianity teach that Jesus is God, but he is the agent through which all of creation, the heavens and the earth, were made. Is there a thing that was made? Jesus willed it to exist. Is there a thing that is not made? Jesus did not will that it would exist. He's the maker of all things. This also, verse 4 and 5, Gaze upon his glory. He is the light of humanity. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The life of Jesus is the light of humanity. His shining life is a clear indication of how the maker of all things designed us to live. This is the glory that we gaze upon of Jesus Christ. But but remember, we asked that question before we looked upon this. How can I gaze upon something that I myself can't see with my own eyes? Well, don't worry. You're in the exact same place as the first people in the first century who first read the Gospel of John. They themselves did not see Jesus Christ with their own eyes, but they knew that they had verifiable proof of the glory of Jesus Christ. How? Look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. You see, our supernatural God entered our natural space. Jesus of Nazareth. His followers walked with him. They saw him. They touched his robes. They heard his voice. The glory that was hidden for ages was fully revealed in all of its majesty through a carpenter who walked in Galilee. And based on the historically verifiable eyewitness accounts of those who saw him, we gaze upon his glory with the gaze of faith. Church, the gaze upon which we look upon Jesus is the gaze of faith. As revealed in his word, a historically viable account of his life, we can gaze upon the glory of Jesus. Well, that's how, but what's it like to actually gaze upon the glory of Jesus? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not a passing glance. It's not a passing glance like what you're scrolling through social media. When you look upon the glory of Jesus, it will dominate your attention. But for some of you, you're like, you've been looking for so long and you're looking and you're trying to find, but, but gazing upon Jesus kind of looks like gazing upon this image on the screen. Have you guys seen one of these before? Anyone seen one of these before sometime in their life? Yeah, this is called a uh, 3D magic eye picture, all right? Apparently, apparently, if you look upon pictures like this, and what they tell you is actually, don't look at the picture, look through the picture. And apparently, if you unfocus your eyes and stare intently at the picture, eventually, you'll see com- some kind of, you, the, the, the images overlap, and you'll see com- some kind of form hidden in there. And, but every, every single time, every single time I've tried to do this, I just throw up my hands, like, I, don't, I, I don't see a thing. And it's just frustrating. Like, there's, what, there is nothing there. What, why would I stare at that? All right, gazing upon the glory of Jesus isn't fuzzy and out-focused. God's word is clear. So if you uh, don't see or don't think like you can gaze upon God and it's not clear, maybe it's because you're not gazing upon God with faith. 
Maybe it's because you're not gazing upon him with humility. What will happen when you gaze upon him with faith and humility? Not only will it dominate your attention, it will capture your attention. And you will see how beautiful he is and you will admire the glory of God. It's kind of more like that piece of artwork that you continually go back to because it's so beautiful and so captivating and you admire it so much. This next picture on the screen is my uh, favorite illustration that I've ever seen. Um, it's drawn by a man named Norman Rockwell. Anyone familiar with Norman Rockwell or any of his work? Yeah, love it, love, love it. When I first saw this, I was just captured by it. Look at the date first. You see, it's the, this is the cover of a magazine. You see the date at the top left? 1945. The picture is called Homecoming GI. Do you remember what happened in the spring of 1945? The Nazi regime was just defeated and the soldiers were finally coming home. And when I saw this, what struck me was not only the real life detail, but the expressions of all the characters on the face. You see straight in center the mom, just arms open, my son is home, and then we assume like a brother running down the stairs, and to the left, maybe that's like just his lover that she, she told him before he left, I'm gonna wait for you, I'm gonna wait for you, and years she's been waiting, and then, but what keeps bringing me back to this picture is actually what I don't see. What's, what's the expression on the face of the soldier that I can't see? Is it just a grin? Is his, are his eyes welling up? And I admire it so much and I keep coming back to it because it's not just a picture, it's a story. Okay, look back here now. <laughs> That's what it's like to look upon Jesus Christ in his glory. It's not gonna be a passing glance. It's not gonna be fuzzy and out of focus when you look at it with faith and humility. It's gonna dominate and capture your attention and you will admire it and you will keep going back because you will say, how beautiful. There's nothing like this. Look upon Jesus Christ. He is the transcendent word of God. Look upon his glory, his truthfulness, his graciousness, his kindness, his justice, and his mercy. And then, then, when you look upon him and see him as he's revealed himself in his word, as he truly is, then you will be able to enjoy your relationship with him. This is the first and most important feature of enjoying a relationship with Jesus. Those who enjoy it gaze upon his glory. And then this second feature, those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus have been enlightened by him. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus have been enlightened by him. Let's look at uh, verse four and verse five again. It says this, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse nine, the true light, Jesus, which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Think of your house. Think of your house in the middle of the night. Uh, think of the path that you need to take through your house in the middle of the night when you gotta get out of bed and you gotta go to the bathroom. Where does that path go and where do you have to travel to get there? So in my home, it's a short distance between bed and bathroom, but it's very dark. Right? And when, he, when we get to the bathroom and we turn the light on, two things happen when we turn a light on in the darkness. First, um, it illuminates a defined area and eventually it will bleed into the darkness and then it will define a boundary between itself and the darkness. This is what Jesus did when he entered into the world. The life of Jesus is the light of humanity. His shining life is a clear indication of how the maker of all things designed us to live. I asked a question on Facebook the other day, um, and I wonder what you guys uh, would say uh, to this. Sam, I think you responded to my Facebook post. Um, so the question I asked was, name the first nocturnal animal that comes to mind. What was it that you said? <laughs> Panamanian night monkey, all right. <laughs> okay. so. Can you, let's see if you think you can know what were the top three 
comments that were given. Do you remember or did you see what they were? Yeah. yeah. What was one of them that you think? Owl, Owl was one of them. Yet, yeah. do you remember another? Bat. Bat. There was one other that was number one. Raccoon. Raccoon was number one, and that's the one that I said. So when my wife and I first moved into our basement apartment, we kept our, um, our uh, recycling bin and green bin outside of our, our door, just in this little gated enclosure. And every night, without fail, when we put a raccoon out, maybe this happened to you, rips open the green bin. And afterwards, please don't come up to me and say, oh, I know what you could do. You could do this. We tried everything. And we don't, do, we don't leave it outside anymore. That's the solution. But our, the enclosure was close enough to the front door, which was close enough to our living room that we could actually hear the little raccoons scurrying around at night. And when I would try and go outside to scare them away, I open up the door, and as soon as I stepped outside, the motion, center, uh, motion sensor light uh, would turn the floodlight on. And as soon as the floodlight turned on, the raccoon would scurry away. Only once did I ever see its little glowy, dirty eyes. Be because as soon as the light would come on, it would run away into the back into the darkness. Those who have a enjoy a relationship with Jesus have been enlightened by him. So, so they enjoy walking in his light. Turn over with me to uh, John chapter three real quick. John chapter three, the, verse 19. I think this verse will help explain what we're trying to get at a little bit more. John chapter three, verse 19. This is Jesus speaking, and this is what he says about light and darkness. John three nineteen. And this is the judgment. Okay, pause for a second, look back here. When Jesus says, and this is the judgment, what he's saying is, what follows is the criteria by which I judge the validity of your claim to having a real relationship with me. Okay, do you understand? All right, let's read what this criteria is. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. For whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Church, how do we know if our claim to a relationship with Jesus is valid? How do we know if our faith has truly saved us. Are you walking in the light or do you scurry away into the darkness? You say you believe in Jesus, you do well. The scripture says Jesus died for our sins, taking the punishment that we deserve, but salvation Two sides of the same coin, faith and repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that influences a change of behavior. Some of you may be new to hear us here at Harvest, or maybe some of you may be new to our just church in general. This is the first church you've ever attended, and you're trying to learn more about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Friends, you need to know that church attendance in and of itself is insufficient evidence to prove that you're walking in the light. Just because you have your butt in the pew, the only relationship that proves is that you have a relationship with a pew. <laughs> Maybe some of you are you're new to here to Harvest and you just recently left another church and you're only at that church for a couple months or a year before you left a church before that, before you left a church before that. Because every time someone comes and invites you to share your life as we should, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, you stir your way into the darkness because you're unwilling to walk in the light. 
if you've truly believed, this will be the attitude you have. I'm not afraid to step out into the light. I'm not afraid to let the filthiest parts of my life be seen before God and before others. Jesus died for me. He loves me and I know I'm forgiven. I'm not afraid to live before, openly before God and others. Because of his love, I know I'm forgiven. If you're scurrying away in shame and unwilling to let your light be exposed, what value does your faith have? Those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus are not afraid to let their shame be exposed because Jesus, they know Jesus Christ bore their shame on the cross and they're not afraid to let other people see the filth of their life because they know that they're forgiven and they're ready and willing to live before others because they know Jesus has changed them. And if you've been scurrying off into the darkness for years, today's the day to step out into the light. Believe. If you will believe and repent, you will be forgiven and you need not hide in shame. You can step out in faith and in courage. Those who have a relationship with Jesus will enjoy walking in the light. Where are you standing now, church? Not only have they been, uh, not only have uh, they gazed upon his glory, and not only have they been enlightened by him, but also this, the next feature of those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus. Those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus have come to know him and receive him. Look back at your text in John chapter one. Turn back over to John one with me. We're gonna read verse 10 and verse 11. John 1, 10 and 11 says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people and his own people did not receive him. Now, interestingly, um, the maker of all things is described as having a relationship with his own people. That's the way that it describes the interaction between Jesus, the maker of all things, and every single human being. This word, his own, or his own people, both those words are only one word in the original language. It's a possessive pronoun. His own implies that the maker of, own th of all things is the owner of all things, including me and including you. Now, we understand that there's a natural link between ownership and between authority. We get this. We get it because of the language that we use. Maybe some of you have used this statement before. Uh, it's my body, and I'll do what I want with it. Ownership authority, or maybe some of you in your unfortunate or um, conversations with your kids. This is my house, and it's my rules, right? Ownership, authority. we get this. But let's flip the script and see how just foolish it is when we think that we own ourselves. Does the canvas have any right to say to the painter, don't paint me like that, paint me this way. Does the potter have any right, or excuse me, does the clay have any right to say to the potter, no, 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 don't, not like that. No, 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 mold me this way. As the maker of all things, Jesus is the owner of all things, including me and including you, and retains authority of over all things. So then, how do we come to know and receive the one who owns us. Well, John 17, six, Jesus actually says what those few people who did receive him, how they responded. Listen to this verse, John 17, six. Praying to his Father in heaven, Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were and you gave them to me. See that possessive language? And 
How did they respond? And they have kept your word. Those who have come to know and receive Jesus enjoy a relationship with him because they enjoy keeping his word. Those who have come to know and receive him, they enjoy keeping his word. Those who enjoy keeping his word, they have a posture of humility and a posture of submission before the scriptures that motivates them to obey what the Bible says. We could say it another way. And this is a great statement to say amen afterwards. In all things, the Bible has the last word. Is that true? Those who have a relationship with Jesus, in all things, they believe the Bible has the last word. When I could get a tax break, but it's all under the table. When I'm thinking about what post-secondary degree I could take. When it's the first day of high school and I'm trying to choose friends. When I'm invited to go to a party and I know there's going to be heavy drinking. In your fashion, in your diet, in your marriage, in your sexuality, or in any other part of the human experience, the Christian response is, the Bible has the last word. You may say, though, it's like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the Bible says about fashion. That's okay. That's why we walk in the light and live our lives before others. Ask a mature Christian that you know, and they'll tell you what 1 Peter chapter 4 says. Don't spend so much time investing to make the outward part of you look beautiful, but invest and spend time making beautiful what God says is beautiful, adorning the inner part, the inner man. Well, okay, can I really trust this is for my good? Don't you think that the maker of all things knows what his creation needs? First John says that his commandments are not burdensome, they're for our good. You may say though, but it's so hard. None of my family lives like this. None of my classmates live like this. None of my coworkers live like this. And when I try to step out and walk in the light and keep his word, I just feel all alone. Listen, I, I know. I know it's hard. Especially in high school, especially in college, especially with a family that ridicules you for your faith or in a workplace where getting ahead in immoral ways is celebrated. I get it's hard. And I understand that you feel alone. But even if you feel alone, when you're on God's side, you're always in the majority. Those who have come to know and receive him enjoy keeping his word. And then this final thing, the fourth feature of those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus. Those who enjoy a relationship with him, they've gazed upon his glory, They've been enlightened by him. They've come to know and receive him. And then finally this, those who enjoy a relationship with Jesus have been born again of God. They have been born again of God. Look back with me in John chapter one, verse 12 and verse 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Lord is our God. He is our maker. He is the light of humanity. But church, friends, there is no more endearing, comforting relationship than knowing that God is our Father, and by faith in Jesus Christ, he looks at us as his own beloved children. Now, some of you might not have a good idea of what it means to have a heavenly father or a father. 
And because your father wasn't a good example, you hear that God wants to be your father and mm, that's not immediately comforting for you. But the reason that you feel that pain in the way that you were hurt by that man is because God created you to feel joy from a person in that position. And all the affirmation that you wanted to have and the leadership you wanted to be given and the love you wanted to receive, God is your perfect heavenly father. He loves the widow. He is the father to the fatherless and provides exactly what our soul needs. And if you've been born again by faith, you are a child of God. And the scripture says that you enjoy the rights, the right of being a child. What rights? What rights do we get from our heavenly father? Well, first this, I, the word of God says that we enjoy the right of inheritance. We enjoy the right of inheritance. Jesus earned the inheritance of eternal life for us by dying for our sins. We don't see Jesus with our eyes because Jesus told us, I'm going back to my father's house and I'm preparing a place for you that I may come back and take you to be with me always. We enjoy the right of an inheritance. So, so children of God, so brothers and sisters in Christ, why do we think that our only hope is in our accomplishments and our achievements? Don't set your hope on what you can accomplish or what you can achieve. Set your hope on what Jesus Christ achieved for you. Everything that you think you can earn, every dollar you think you can make, every boat, every house, every car, everything that you want your kid to be, it's all gonna be dust one day. But we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And if you are in the family of God, it can never be taken away from you. Don't set your hope on your accomplishments. Set your hope on your inheritance. There's another right. Oh, this is beautiful. We enjoy the right of love. We know the Father loves us because he sent his only son to die for us. But I know every day that my Father in heaven loves me because when I obey his word, he affirms me with, by filling me with joy. And when I disobey his word, and it's just as often as everyone in this room, when I disobey his word, he convicts me of what I've done that's wrong. Hebrews chapter 12 says, what child does a father have that he does not reprove when he's done wrong? If you haven't been reproved, you're not his child. You see the, you see the cups on the tapes, uh, tables at the front. We're taking communion today. And before communion, Pastor Paul always reminds us that we must examine our hearts. And if there's any unconfessed sin that we have, to acknowledge to God that it's wrong. What have you been holding on to that you should have let go months or years ago? And maybe you've felt God's loving conviction, but you've just, you just numb it. You just numb it by taking more steps into the darkness. The re that guilt you feel isn't bad, it's good. It's God training you to welcome you back into his light, to welcome you back into his word, to welcome you back to the joy of his presence because he knows that to be with him is better. To be with him is better. And that's his love. We enjoy the right of inheritance, the right of love, and then this finally, we enjoy the right of forgiveness. We didn't earn forgiveness, Jesus Christ earned our forgiveness because he suffered so that we could be saved. But now if we are children of God, we are forgiven. Do you remember that story 
the, the, head, the uh, subtitle in your Bible might call it the prodigal son. I don't like that word because the word's not actually in the Bible prodigal, but it, it's the abandoning son. Maybe that's not better. Uh, the, the, the blaspheming son, uh, the, the, rebel, the rebellious son, the son who told his dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. I want to go off to the city and party and drink and buy all the girls that I can because I hate you. That's kind of long to fit in my Bible, but Jesus told this story that we commonly call the prodigal son. And this boy took his father's money and went to the city and spent it all on drink and sex until he had nothing left. And then he was forced to take the worst job a young boy in that culture could take by working with pigs. And he got to a place where he realized what he did and how wrong it was. And he thought to himself, maybe I can go back home, but and there's no way, there's no way dad's gonna forgive me. He's got a lot of, he's got a lot of hired servants. Maybe, maybe he'll hire me to, be, to, uh, to work the fields or maybe he'll hire me as a slave. And he did not think himself worthy of forgiveness. But do you remember how the father responded when he saw his son coming from afar? Do you remember? He got up and he ran towards him, not with anger, not with just vindicate, with open, compassionate arms. He threw the best robe around his son because he was his son. He put the best ring on his son because he was his son. And he didn't hire him as a slave. He welcomed him back as his son. And maybe you, you know that you're a child of God, but you've been away from the arms of your father for a long time and you wonder could he even receive me like this sister in Christ you are his daughter and whatever any other guy has said to shame you or what any other thing you have said to me uh, to yourself to make you feel less of yourself the father looks at you with the same eyes that he looks at his own beloved son Jesus Brother in Christ, I know you've been walking in foolishness for years. He's ready to receive you as you are, if you would be ready to come back to him. Those who enjoy a relationship with Christ have this beautiful relationship. Drop this anchor down in seasons of doubt, in seasons of fear, in seasons of worry. God is my heavenly father and he loves me as his own child. And because of Jesus Christ, it is secure. So, come back to your loving father. James chapter four says that he is jealous for the spirit that he has made to dwell in you. He wants you with him. Will you walk with him? Will you gaze upon his glory? Will you walk in his light? Will you keep his word? Will you enjoy all the rights that we have as one of his children earned by Jesus Christ, which has caused us to be born again? Drop this anchor down and it will motivate you in the hardest of seasons to enjoy what God has for you in a relationship with him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this hope. Thank you for the comfort of the scriptures. Father, I pray that my friends today, that they would be comforted by your Holy Spirit, that they would know that through Jesus Christ, through what he suffered, that they can be forgiven. God, God, it wasn't a light thing to be, have his back cut open. It wasn't a light thing to be nailed to a cross. We know that it cost much for our forgiveness, but we believe that it was enough. And now, God, motivate us, motivate your church to give everything back to you because you gave everything to us and to know because of the way that you love us that we can know you and love you. We can gaze upon you. We can walk in your light. We can keep your word and we can enjoy the rights of being your children. 
Father, if there's anyone today that is yet to believe and yet to repent or thinks they have believed but yet never have repented, awaken them to faith today that they might be saved and know you. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can enjoy a relationship with you. We give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.